Hey everyone, it's DDP here, back from a short little, not even hiatus, like I was out of town a, a day, basically, for the holidays, but it unfortunately corresponded with a Mavericks game, and wouldn't you know it, it was the Luka Doncic return game. So, I'm a little bit behind, but I got back in town earlier today, and I revisited everything that happened in this game, went through and watched all the uh, the stuff I had recorded on it, which was a fair bit, not the whole game, oddly, I don't know what happened to my DVR there, but I got I got all the little gaps filled in there, so... Yeah, this is uh this is Luka Doncic's return game and Dallas gets the win 102-98 over the San Antonio Spurs. It was a ho hum shooting night for Luka. Like it wasn't anything great. The fact that you can say 24-10 and 8 a near triple double is ho hum for him shows you how high he has set that bar by his own standards. And you know, he got 33 minutes, so it's not like he was on a minutes restriction, but in the game Luka shoots just 9 of 23 from the field. One of six from three, five of eight at the line, including two misses in the final minute that really would have iced the game where they were. And instead, San Antonio is able to kind of climb back into it here. This was nearly a repeat of the Toronto game with Dallas basically allowing, I think it was, let me see here. Bobby Carlo on Twitter points out that the Spurs ended the game on a 13-0 run. But the Mavericks, with time, this time as their ally, not quite enough of it as their ally in Toronto, get a 102-98 win. And yeah, this is this is a weird one here because on one hand, the Spurs, they're not the same style of play as the rest of the league, so it kind of shifts things a little bit. Like Dallas is still like 115.3 points per 100 possessions, which is still on pace for the most... Uh, the, the most efficient offense in NBA history. So they're still right there. But the story of this game is, it's actually not as much about Luka in this case. Like, you still got other good contributors in this case. Tim Hardaway Jr., 17 points. That's very serviceable in his regard. Although, you know, you're, you're going to have the same issues with Tim Hardaway Jr. that you always have in this regard. 7 of 14, the fact that you got that out of him, and 3 of 6 from, the, uh, from beyond the arc, you pretty much got above that typical line you're going to get from him. Usually you're going to get a guy who, even if he gives you 17 points, he's going to have to work his ass off to get him. And yeah, KP's shot kind of went back in the tank a little bit. I'm hoping this is just a bump because KP had been playing pretty well in Luka's absence. No, by no means am I saying it's better for KP if Luka's not there, so don't even comment on that, although I'm sure more than a few people are going to throw that in the comments. KP 13 and 8 and 13 points, 8 boards, three assists. Again, another 35 minutes for him. Any kind of men's restriction is out the window. Now, you might still have some back-to-back scenarios where depending on his workload in night one, they might hold him out of night two. But even that storyline that we were hearing going into the season, even that seems to be an afterthought at this point. But KP, not a good shooting night. 4 of 15, 3 of 8 from 3, 2 of 4 at the line as well. One block, one steal. This is a... I, I want to dive actually straight into... The post game stuff because I feel like for the storyline coming out of this game, that's where a lot of this is placed, right? It's no it's no secret that a lot of the kind of old guard of the NBA, your Charles Barkley's, your Shaquille O'Neal's, they're looking at this and they're saying, Well, the answer to fixing KP's game in this case, to get him more integrated with the Mavericks and to get the best out of the team and out of him within that team, is clearly to put him on the post. And we've talked about this already. His points per post-up are not good this year. They're the worst of his career. Even if you took him pre-injury and what his points per post-up were, it's not better than what the Mavericks offense is already averaging in this case. We have, again, I said it earlier, I'll say it again, the number one offense in NBA history as of right now in terms of points per 100 possessions. That is most efficient offense Ever. And they want to see us tweak it. They want to see an overhaul and how we attack things. Now, Carlisle, Carlisle's been hearing this stuff. Like, he's obviously not listening to the TNT halftime team and all that. He's not hearing what they're trying to say. But even still, it's really interesting the, the kind of criticism you're getting from the outside in as everyone's trying to, from afar, from a casual glance, kind of put their finger on why KP is struggling somewhat this year, disregarding what he's done the past few games. 
And, you know, during the game, you had Chris Webber, the color commentator, making mentions about how, you know, KP plays too much on the perimeter. He, he really needs to, to post up. Halftime, you got Shaq saying this as well. Uh, here's Shaq's quote here. He said, Luka Doncic needs to give you or needs you to be a great one-two punch. They don't fear Dallas right now. I think he's talking league-wide at that point in the context of it. Uh, they don't fear Dallas right now, but if he steps up and plays like they want him to play, they might. Charles Barkley then added on to that saying, Rick Carlisle has got to say, yo, man, we need you to be aggressive. We can't rely on Doncic every night. Although in his case, he probably said Don Kick. So, yeah, you you have that criticism. And I've, I've already called this out in the past, but it's interesting that Rick Carlisle chimed in on this finally. This is Carlisle, his post-game uh, press conference, really had an interesting tirade here. Great write-up by Tim Cato of The Athletic. I'll give you some of these quotes here from Rick here. Uh, I'm just going to read this off here. So Rick Carlisle said after the game, the post-up just isn't a good play anymore. It isn't that good of a play. It's not a good play for a 7-3 guy. It's a low-value situation. Our numbers are very substantial that when he spaces the floor, he being Porzingis, when he spaces beyond the three-point line, you know, we're a historically good offensive team. And when any of our guys go in there, our effectiveness is diminished exponentially. Go in in there being referring to the post. I kind of wish there was little excerpts to give full breakdown of this. It's counterintuitive. I understand that. But it's a fact. I think there's certain situations where it makes sense. If we can get him on a roll in the paint towards the rim, that's a good situation. And that's what we'll try to do with all of our guys. I don't... er, We don't post anybody up. We post Luke up every once in a while when he has a real small guy on him. But even in those situations, the value of those situations has plummeted. We've got to realize that the game has changed. It's changed. It's just a fact. And he's a guy, when he spaces beyond the arc, above the break, a historically great all-time three-point shooter with unbelievable efficiency. And the thing I like about his game right now is he his, his reads have gotten better uh, let me see here. His reads have gotten better. His spacing is better. He's driving the ball directly for dunks. He's throwing some really cool lob passes to Dwight. Dwight Powell. I mean, you've got a 7'3 guy throwing to a 6'10 guy on a lob. That's pretty fucking cool, if you ask me, said Rick. He goes into this more, and he's talking about the specifics here. But basically, the idea is the post-up game that the NBA was built around it doesn't exist anymore. And Rick talks about how, you know, well, KP, yeah, what we're asking him to do is different compared to what he did in New York. In New York, they ran the triangle offense, and that was pretty much just a Phil Jackson thing. Like, Phil Jackson, yeah, he he was a master of that, probably the greatest coach of all time in terms of his total resume. But it's still a guy who, you know, His thing was not common. His system was not common. You don't have three basically guys camped out in the paint, three post players more or less. And that's basically what Rick was saying is like, show me anyone else who runs that offense. Show me anyone else who runs it and is efficient with it. It's just not modern basketball anymore. And people forget Rick Carlisle was the coach of the Pacers and the Pistons. Took them both to Eastern Conference champion, or yeah, Eastern Conference finals, by the way. But... He had a long stint in the Eastern Conference when games were decided like 76-68. He knows what the evolution of the game has been. And part of what's made some guys, some coaches great in terms of their legacy and their longevity, guys like Greg Popovich and Carlisle, they've evolved with the game. They saw where the game was 20 years ago, and they said, we're winning with this style of basketball right now. But can you take a 2004 offense of scheme and transplant it into 2019 and still be, you know, even where the Mavericks are right now, a 20 and 10 team? You can't. And that's what Rick's trying to say. Like, you have to consider this too. KP at seven foot three, he's not, I think he weighs like 240. He's not a big dude. His center of gravity is crazy high. So when you consider him trying to post up, he's not a bruiser. His body, even though he added 20 pounds of muscle over the summer, is not built for that. Dallas understands that, and they're going to say, hey, we're not going to send you down into the post to try and bang bodies and back dudes down because that's just not 
what the game calls for at this point, you're more valuable to us. And it's, it's not what his strength is either. You're more valuable to us using your finesse to your game, your shooting touch and ability, spacing the floor. And yeah, we can get you on the, on the elbow. We can get you down low on, on the low post on occasion for a turn and shoot situation. But Dallas isn't even, as Tim Cato mentions, they're not even like the bottom of the league in terms of post-up opportunities. That's the Brooklyn Nets. Like Dallas, yeah, they don't do a, hardly any post-ups in, in this game at this point, or excuse me, in this season at this point. But again, it's resulted in the most efficient offense in NBA history to date. So what is the what is the argument? What is the counter argument? Hey, change everything about what you do. If you look league wide across the NBA right now, uh, I think you can find the team with the most post ups, and I think that's the Charlotte Hornets in this case. Uh, their post ups is like 0.94 points per uh, possession, and that's that's still not as efficient as what Dallas is doing now. Even if you factor that out over the course of 100 possessions, you're a substantial bit back. You really are. Like you're not you're not where you need to be, and this offense isn't what it is right now. If they go with that mentality. Now, I'm not saying there's zero gray area in there. Sure, you can incorporate a couple situations here and there. But the fact that you have all these people from their armchairs or their studios pointing and saying, KP, 7-3 on the block. That's your answer. Look, he's not hitting threes enough right now. You clearly need to put him in the low post. That's that's a former era of basketball. And I get it. It's general convention and wisdom. But the game has moved beyond that. It's not just like, hey, what sounds like the simplest solution? Tall guy, low block, good. It's not how it works. So KP's value, and he needs to play better. He does. And largely he has been in the last couple weeks. But he needs to play better. Even before Luka went down with that injury, KP was playing better. And yes, I know Luka's reintegration game, not a great game for KP. They're going to have to keep working on that, but I'm I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful that that will improve. So the fact is, uh, as Carlisle calls out, you know, he goes on this tirade. They say tirade. They say rant. If you hear the audio, he's not. it's not steaming. Everything he's saying is actually very straightforward, concise, makes sense. It's just a matter of understanding the game is not what it used to be. So, yeah, it's something where Dallas... They're not going to do it. They're not going to post him up more. They're not going to say, hey, this is a solution. Uh, Again, if you want to read more on that, Tim Cato has a good breakdown of all of that. It's on The Athletic. It is a subscription-based article service. So, you know, normally I would try and share that with you guys, but because it's subscription-based, I I don't have access to give that to you. Otherwise, I would. But it's just something where Dallas is going to have to – they're going to have to figure out how to get KP – more comfortable, more integrated into the flow of what they're doing. And there's going to be a time where his shot starts falling better and Luca's going to get him in the positions he needs to get in and they're going to do fine. Again, this team is 20 and 10. They are fifth in the Western Conference. This is, this is light years better than what I thought they were going to be going into the season. It's better than what probably 98% of people thought they were going to be this season. There were some people who said 50 wins. I wasn't one of them. In fact, I probably scoffed at the time. I probably said, you know, you got to make a trade earlier in the season of some worth to find a part that makes that happen. But I picked 44 wins with the team currently constructed. As we stand 30 games through the season, they're pretty much halfway to what I called. So, yeah, their pace is better than what I projected. We'll see how they hold up to that. Their next game is going to be at Golden State. Uh, in this, this this is going to be an interesting stretch for the Mavericks, I think, as they get everything back situated. They've gone through this murderer's row, and as I said earlier, they nearly gave away this game in the same manner in which they gave away the Toronto game. And I think had it bit them twice, yeah, you would start to really, really feel it a little bit. As far as Luka after the game... You know, he commented on missing those free throws and just basically said, look, I, I was a little bit gassed, you know? You you can take... Yeah, he missed four games, and that's not a crazy long time, but you wear down a little bit. Your conditioning is a somewhat affected in that way, and so to come back and immediately play 30-plus minutes, 
yeah, after a week and a half or whatever it was of not having to go full speed 100% except for like one practice, that's going to have an impact on you. So with this, the Mavericks now go to Golden State. Then they go back to L.A. to face the Lakers. It's not a rubber match. There's going to be another one of them after this. But it is going to, you know, we're tied at one in the season series there. That'll be a really interesting one as well on Sunday, December 29th. Then they go to Oklahoma City and the surprisingly decent Thunder right now. Chris Paul is actually playing pretty well for the Thunder. Last I saw, they were in seventh in the Western Conference. I don't know if that's where they stand currently, but they're in that picture right now. They're playing really well, although they just got beat by Memphis. Then you come back to the AAC for matchups with the Hornets. Before the Hornets, actually, you got the Nets. Nets, Hornets, Bulls, Nuggets, Lakers, 76ers. So you're about to have an extended homestand. And if it weren't for the fact that this team is now 9-7 and seven at home after this latest victory, I would probably feel pretty good about that, especially with some of those teams sprinkled in there, some teams that you definitely look at and say, okay, yeah, we, we can you know see where we fall with some of these other games because we feel pretty good and pretty confident about that. But... Mm, there's some there's some good ones in here that should be fairly gimmies. Not not that any game in the NBA is a gimme, but as close as you can get to it being a gimme unless it's the next game, in which case, dear God. Uh, but that's kind of what they're looking at. The fact is, Dallas is, what, 11-3 and three on the road at this point this year? Only losses being at Boston, at New York, and at Toronto in another game you shouldn't have lost. This team is, this team is built as a group of road warriors. And if they can find even just a little bit of that badass mentality and apply it to their home schedule, which Carlisle addressed uh, in recent interviews this week, saying, look, we know we're not playing good enough at home. We we recognized it. We've talked a little bit about it internally. And we just got to play. We got to play, you know, with our backs against the wall a little bit, kind of like they do on the road. For the most part, on the road, they have played better because they're, they're playing as if, you know, hey, we understand we're in a hostile environment. We need to capitalize on this, and we need to play our best. Whereas at home, for whatever reason, they've been kind of eh, not not all the way there, especially early on, slower momentum. And in this game was another case of it. You know, a lower scoring first quarter kind of put them in an early hole. I talked earlier uh, about a week ago about how this team, when they score at least 30 points in the first quarter, which they've averaged about 35 at the time, they have like a 15 and one record, something crazy. You don't do it though, and it's much more eh, a little bit gray there for the Mavericks. So they're gonna have to take that next step, see where it takes them. But I know this wasn't a video talking too much about the game itself. All you really need to know in this case, the Mavericks, Luca's return, a little bit of a ho hum by his standards return, but you get a win. You were up 17, three minutes left. You nearly had a repeat of the Toronto game. It's all right. You still won by four. And now you have a chance to kind of put it behind you. Go to Golden State, who just beat the Rockets, by the way. Just beat the Rockets. So, Eastside Herald, I don't know where you're trolling in here. You always hang around. Uh, I don't want to hear nothing from you for a while. Because the Warriors, yeah, the Knicks are bad, I grant you. But you lost to, like, the worst record in the NBA by far this year. Gonna need to do a little bit of work on the, on your own team before you run your mouth about ours. But that's gonna do it for my time, guys. I'm DDP. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.